Thank you very much. Yeah, and Hosanna, interesting word. I mean, it is a thanksgiving word, and it also means save us. And so Jesus was their hope for that. Well, since we get to do Palm Sunday by itself, we get this very special reading of Jesus throwing out the money lenders, um, throwing out the people who sell doves for rituals at the temple. We get this story of him cursing the fig tree. At the very end of our gospel, we get this curious and vivid story about the fig tree. And I like to sometimes point at this incident to highlight Jesus' humanity. See, everyone gets a little hangry. If you don't know what hangry means, it's the kind of getting grumpy when you feel like you're ready for a meal. And here he is walking along the road, and he stops by this poor, innocent tree. And in other Gospels, we hear that it isn't even the right season for fig trees to bear fruit. But nonetheless, Jesus gets upset because he can't satisfy his hunger, and he curses the fig tree. Well, while this can be a humorous look at hangriness, there's actually a lot more to talk about here. The fig tree is symbolic of Jesus' encounter with Jerusalem and the previous day's events at the temple. Jesus came to Jerusalem, not just the central seat of the Israelite people, but also God's seat, only to find its religious and spiritual relevance replaced by commercial enterprise and cheap theology. People would come to the temple hungry for God and hungry for redemption. This was the central place for rituals and healing, cleansing, and celebration. But when you got to the temple, you had to pay for these various services. Not only this, but the very money that you carried on your person, the coins themselves were not good enough for these services. People stood outside the doors who could help you exchange your common coins for temple coins. And maybe who's the wiser if you're getting a fair exchange rate? Jesus, on the eve of his ultimate sacrifice, arrives at the temple hungry for God and hungry for God's love. After a long day's travel, he rides a donkey into town to cheers and shouts of Hosanna, save us, save us. And this is what he finds at the end of his journey, a temple debased in commercial and transactional enterprise and a religious leadership that does not take its respect for its duty to embody God's love and faithfulness seriously. So what does Jesus do? What else can Christ do but curse the fig tree? He upends tables, chases out the money changers, and makes a scene. On behalf of Scripture and love for his neighbor, rage compels Jesus to push back against the corrupted religious scene around him. The temple which was to be a place of prayer, worship, sanctuary, loving proclamation, and God's presence had instead become a barren desert of worldliness, sanctions, laundering, and exploitation of God's people. In short, this temple no longer bore fruit to satisfy the hunger of God's people. This text and these stories bear the utmost importance and relevance to our modern day and worldwide Christian church. Christianity, in some cases, has become so transactional and exploitative as Jesus' early encounter with the temple at Jerusalem. Sometimes we find ourselves listening to Christian music, watching movies, even at Christian concerts, or even in church, and it can't help but feel like one long commercial. People come to Christianity because we hunger for prayer, for worship, for sanctuary, for loving proclamation, and for God, are we delivering on these promises? Are we bearing fruit? Our gospel for this morning challenges us as inheritors of the gospels to look for fruit on this tree. We are called to upend tables, drive out money changers, and proclaim a God who has already done enough for you, a God who does not require your money for healing or cleansing. We are called to be critical of theology and practice which cheapen God's sacrifice. Instead, we proclaim a word of forgiveness and love to our neighbor. As we ready ourselves for Holy Week, for Christ's Last Supper, 
for Christ's betrayal, death, and even resurrection, we are called to cleanse ourselves and shed this transactional relationship with our faith. Instead, we look to the cross and we understand that no money, no actions, no leaders, no walls or policies can ever approach that overwhelming grace of Christ who gave us everything that he had. We look to the cross and we proclaim God revealed. God looks like Jesus' broken body on the cross. God does not look like dividing a criminal's clothing. God looks like a raging blasphemer who upends tables in church because it doesn't care for God's people. Here in this text this morning, we find permission to be angry. Angry with Christ's church when it strays from a proclamation of forgiveness, mercy, life, and love. Here we find permission to incriminate ourselves as part of that wandering. Here we are convicted for not giving voice to challenge. Here, God calls the church instead to be a place of prayer, of worship, sanctuary, proclamation, and God. In the days before the holiest week in the church, Jesus challenges us and rends our churches looking for a safe place to worship and remembering God's faithfulness to God's people. We prepare our hearts as Christ prepared the temple. We upend that which co-ops God for earthly gain, and instead we embody service and love once more. As we enter Holy Week this year, we do not do so in a mindset of tra transaction and commercial return. Rather, we enter Holy Week as penitent, reflective, and hope-filled people of God, expectant that God can do everything with nothing, that God will conquer death and sin for us, but not because we have earned it. In this Holy Week, I pray we may think critically about God's church on earth and its fruits. May you upend tables that exploit and curse that which bears no fruit. May you find a God who requires nothing of you in return for the gift of everything. May you find God on the cross. Amen.